family has an opportunity to go back and and just see uh, what was presented and and go through it slowly so that maybe you can you can do it or replicate it. Um, today we have the pleasure of having Nora Pace, who works over at RIRO. And she's going to be talking about, um, and it's sort of a long title here, weekly checklist supported by self-study, reading, writing, grammar. And she uses um, the Google tool Loom. She, from our conversation, sounds like uses a lot of different technology. I hadn't seen anyone using Loom, so that's stuck out to me personally. So um, Laura, uh, Nora is not the last person, by the way, in this series, in case you thought that was possible. Um, we don't have any other any other sessions next week, but the following week there should be two others. One's definitely scheduled, and the other is in process of being scheduled. So uh, we're not finished with this series of teachers presenting to other teachers in Rhode Island, but so there will be more of them, and um, there will be evaluations, which we'll send out to you maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but sometime soon. So I am going to turn this over to Nora. Let her introduce herself and her work and just simply say thank you for being here today and appreciate what you're doing. So thanks, Nora. It's all yours. Thank you, Joan. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I am going to present um, a little Google Slides presentation that I've made for you guys. Um, as Joan said, you're definitely welcome to ask questions at any point. I'm also going to hopefully save a little time at the end um, that will be just for questions. So if you've got them, um, you can ask at any time. I am looking at the chat. Um, so if you want to uh, jump in there and ask a question there, that's fine. Um, or you can also unmute yourself if you've got anything you want me to hear. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've been working at RIRAL since September. So I'm relatively new to adult education. I also work in schools. Um, right now I teach eighth and ninth grade in Woonsocket at um, Beacon Charter School and the Associated Middle School, which is called Founders. Um, so I've been teaching for a while, but this is kind of um, my first year of adult education. So there's a lot of adaptations. And um, thanks so much to my colleagues at RIRAL who are really supportive and awesome, and many of them are here. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting on using a weekly checklist to do online teaching. Um, and I'm hoping that um, I'll be able to share this presentation with you so you can access it um, and it is being recorded also. So this is what I'll be going over today. Um, I wanna talk through how my anticipated challenges in transitioning to online teaching actually led me to design the course the way that I did. Um, and I'll then give you an overview of how my class is set up, how I communicate with students, what I'm actually teaching. Um, I'll dip into the value of demonstration and models that I've found particularly helpful um, during this online teaching time. Um, and that's where I'll be talking about Loom. Um, and then I will also talk a little bit about how relationships and community play into this. Um, at the end, I'll kind of tell you how this experiment went and what I see as the benefits of doing this. Um, and there'll be some time for questions as well. So I'm sure that you all kind of had some of the same feelings as I did when I learned we were going online. Um, it was definitely kind of a like, whoa moment. Um, and so I started thinking about what my course should look like. And I really focused on some challenges that I anticipated coming up. Um, I'm sure that these are similar challenges that many of you have maybe faced or thought about. Um, but I'll just go through how those big three on the screen kind of led me to the type of course that I ended up with. So first of all, my students are very busy with work and childcare. Um, many of my students are still working and were continuing to work throughout this whole lockdown situation. Um, and many of them, actually almost all of my students are parents and they have their children at home with them, whether they're small children or they're school-aged children who are now obviously doing school from home. 
So I wanted to make the course as flexible as I possibly could um, in terms of time and also in terms of commitment. I didn't want learning to be something that felt overwhelming or uh, too difficult to connect with. And I definitely didn't want students who are already stressed out with life to feel like they weren't doing enough and therefore to disengage. So I looked for ways to have multiple face-to-face -face opportunities for engagement. Um, I created a weekly checklist of assignments and those can be completed anytime. I'll show you exactly how that works um, in a couple slides. And then also thinking about how to base my schedule on my students' availability. So I was teaching two night classes um, and I kept my office hours during the evening, figuring that that's when students could attend like they were before. Um, but I also offered the opportunity to schedule a one-on-one -on -one conference at any time based on when students were available to do that. Um, the second issue that I saw coming up was technology access. So most of my students have either a smartphone or a laptop, but most of them don't have both. Um, some of them have tablets too. And not all of them have home Wi-Fi. Some of them use data on their phones. Some of them are also sharing devices, whether they have a partner working at home or they have children who are doing school. Um, sometimes these families have one laptop that they might be sharing with all of them. Um, so that led me to the idea of doing mostly asynchronous learning. I know that many teachers um, set up their learning classroom environment in kind of a uh, what they had translated into a digital space. I chose not to do that. Um, so I chose to use less video um, and use more asynchronous um, learning time and also some off-screen things. So students could, for example, handwrite all their assignments if they wanted to. Um, I also made sure that everything would be accessible on a smartphone in case that's the only device that students had. Um, and then my third kind of big challenge that I thought about was the low digital literacy of some of my students. Um, I would say that for most of my students, using a computer is some degree of challenge. Um, I have a few who are amazing and can do things I can't do at all. Um, but for most of them, it's kind of a hurdle to get over. So I tried to keep everything simple. Simple is best. Um, I used very few platforms. I didn't want my students to have to learn anything new. Um, or learn as little as possible in terms of just accessing a platform. Um, so I really just used um, email, Google Forms, Google Docs, and IXL. Um, and most of my students had already been using IXL. So um, for a couple of them, I did have to kind of teach them how to navigate that. Um, one of the things I also thought about was limiting the amount of times that students would have to sign in or log in to something because that presents another barrier for forgetting the password or not knowing how to log in um, or getting stuck in those ways. So I tried to keep everything very open access. Um, they didn't have to use their viral email addresses. They could use their personal email addresses. And I sent all of their weekly assignments by email um, and by hyperdoc which is just a doc with links in it so every week the students would get their assignments and all they had to do was click so i'm sure that some of you anticipated um, some of these challenges as well i would love to hear from you um, whether by unmuting or by writing in the chat if you also face these challenges or if there are other challenges that you want us to think about during this webinar so what other challenges do you see with online learning? Okay, so Bill says most of my students use phones. Um, 
yeah, definitely recognize that as a common access thing. I'll give it a little more space in case you've got an idea. Sue says we have to be flexible about distractions in students' home. Yes, absolutely. Um, Marie says that work schedules might vary. Um, there's one more. Sorry, I'm reopening my chat here. Um, multiple levels of learners. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a really good challenge um, to take into account. Okay. Um, so thanks for that input. And maybe once we get towards the end of this presentation, we can see if any of those additional challenges could also be addressed by something like what I'm doing. All right. So this is a snapshot of what students were actually receiving from me. Um, I'll just go over how I set this up in a couple of different ways. So um, every week at the beginning of the week, usually on Mondays, I sent out an email to all of my students and it had the week's assignments and schedules along with uh, just a little note from me, um, usually something encouraging, try to keep it positive. So this first part that you can see on your screen is um, part of the email that they actually got. So I have the schedule, two office hour um, opportunities per week. So I did Tuesday and Thursday. Um, those were from 7 to 8 p.m. And I gave them a Google Meet link. So again, all they have to do is click on that, um, whether they're on their phone or their laptop. And they can also call into Google Meet, um, as you're probably aware. So a few of them took advantage of that. Um, and then I will sh show this to you a little bit later. But they also have the option to schedule a conference with me. And there's just a form to fill out to set that up. So right at the top of the email, the students know when are we meeting this week and how do I get there? And I also did send calendar invitations um, for those office hours. Um, so I'm including all of my weekly assignment sheets. They're linked here on this presentation um, so that if you do want to actually just look at them and steal whatever you want, that's totally fine with me. This is what the assignment looks like in a Google Doc form. So what's really nice about Google Docs is that it's super easy to turn it into HyperDocs, which just means that it's a Google Doc with embedded links. Um, I am including at the very end of this presentation um, a little instruction on how to do that, but it's very, very easy. So as you can see, um, students are looking at this chart they have a reading, a writing, and a grammar assignment for every week. Um, that didn't change. I have one of each every single week. Um, so they've got a little reading, some reading questions. And I want to point out that what I've tried to do in these assignment sheets is give really specific instructions for how to turn things in. Um, oftentimes, a barrier that students face is their doing the work, but they don't know how to get it to me. And I try to be as flexible as possible in how they could actually turn things in. So you see under the writing assignment, it says share your work with Nora in an email or on a document. So if students didn't feel good about using a Google Doc or making a copy or anything, um, they could just type their writing in an email and just hit send. So again, it's about taking away as many barriers as I could possibly anticipate. Um, for the grammar every week, that's where I did most of the actual upfront instruction. Um, so where it says for extra help, watch this video. That's a video I created on Loom. Um, it goes over how to do the skill, what are some of the important concepts, and then there's a little demonstration of me doing the IXL skills as a model for the students. Um, so they can watch that video and then go straight to IXL and start practicing so that they're getting that um, instruction and practice really close together. 
Um, in terms of what I'm teaching, I am obviously an ELA teacher. So I'm focused on reading and writing, um, really working on my students' skills. They are at very different levels. Um, so I kind of know what those levels are from teaching them already this year. And I also um, try to make my writing prompts really open-ended so that um, a student could see this prompt, write about a place you've lived, and they could, um, they could write a short paragraph, they could write a whole essay. Some students could even just write a list, write what was good about that place and what was bad. So this is kind of as flexible as we can go with um, just giving a prompt and then seeing what students produce based on their different levels. Um, does anyone have questions so far about assignments, like what I'm assigning and how they're getting sent to students? And if you don't have a question, you could type no in the chat so I know when I can move on. Um, so Marie's asking, how do you anticipate time for assignments? Um, that's a good question. It actually varies a lot by student how much time they're going to spend on this. Um, so I am thinking about what I could do within my regular two and a half hour class. Um, this is definitely an amount that I could cover in that time. So it's about the same amount of work weekly. But the nice thing about this is that students can spread it out and take as much time as they need. Um, so I've got a couple of students who would do everything in one day and turn it in. And then and it might have taken them about an hour to do the reading and writing. Um, but then I also have students who are like doing multiple drafts of their writing and sending them for feedback and going back and editing and all of that. So they're choosing to take that more time. Um, I can also see through IXL how much time students are spending on practicing those skills. All right, I'm going to keep going, but definitely stop me if you've got a question. OK, so I wanted to show you, um, I'll go back for a second. The blue links on this sheet lead to these things, right? So I just want to show you how it actually looks to the students. Um, there are some tricks here for making things easier to access. So for example, the reading for this week was uh, from the house on Mango Street. The whole PDF of the whole book is available online, but I actually saved it as just three pages, the three pages that I wanted them to read. So they know exactly when to stop. They don't have to look at directions to see, oh, read until page 25. They can just read what I sent them and then they know they're done. Um, for IXL, I like sending the link to the skill because IXL is really great in how much it has, but that also can make it hard for students to navigate and find the right skill that they're supposed to be working on. Um, there are multiple ways to indicate that to students, but for me, with the HyperDoc, it's easiest to just put the link to the skill. So they click on that. They do have to sign in usually, um, and then they're right at that exact skill. Um, IXL will also suggest lower level skills that are related. So if they scroll down, it will say, or it says something like, um, not feeling ready, try these instead. And it's like an easier skill that's related to that. Um, these are some reading questions for the house on Mango Street. And you'll notice that I put the directions for how to turn it in at the top of the document. So it's all in that same place. So they can actually see what to do while they're on that doc and then they type their answers and then they turn it in and it's all in one place. So they don't have to switch back and forth, even though for most of us, switching back and forth between tabs seems so easy. 
um, for many of our learners, that's just another step that makes it a little more complicated and makes it seem a little more hard. And so trying to get rid of all of those challenges that make it seem like, oh, maybe I don't want to do this because it's hard, um, lets me just focus more on what they're actually learning. All right, so I wanted to show um, at least one example of student work. I have more, but I don't want to um, go over my time. So I'll show you one. Um, this is from one of my students who is completing an assignment to describe a person she knows well. So she's chosen to write about her niece. Um, and you'll see that there's kind of two parts to this um, writing piece. There is a little paragraph that is about, um, oh, sorry, I have more questions in the chat. I'm gonna go back to those before I, um, sorry, I'm just reading them. Okay, um, I'll go back for a second before I talk about more student work. Um, so, how did you separate the lesson to make it only three pages? This is actually one Google Doc, um, and they uh, can see the schedule it would be above this on the document, and then they just scroll down to the assignments. Um, so it's all in one place. I just made a little chart um, for them, just inserted a table for that. Um, and you'll be able to see some examples too once you have access to this PowerPoint. Um, what resources am I using to get my assignments? So um, I mostly use things that I already had. Um, so in terms of reading, I kind of store up a lot of short reading assignments and just like have a folder of them. Um, Newzella, like Albert mentioned, Newzella does have free access for educators right now. Um, I'm using that with my school age students, but not with my adults right now. Um, Rural has given us um, access through uh, for IXL. So that's um, from my organization. Um, if students don't have computer access, they can do everything here on a phone. So IXL does have a phone app. Um, I haven't used it too much, so I'm not sure exactly how facile it is for the students. Um, they can use Google Docs on their phone too, so they could easily um, access this uh, doc with the questions, but they could also write out the questions and take a picture and send it to me. Um, they could write out the questions and come to office hours and speak them to me. Um, they can read this PDF on their phone. So I think it's there's a lot of details in all of those access things, so I won't go over all of them, but I'm always thinking about what is the best way for students to, um, to access all of it and to have multiple options for access and for turning things in. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to my student work here um, and definitely feel free to add more questions. Sorry to, to jump back and forth a little bit. Um, so this is an example of student writing. It had two sections. One is a description of a person and the other one is a comparison between the student and the person they're writing about. Um, so this is a student who actually went through a couple of drafts on this and this is her latest version. She's actually still revising and sending it to me, which is so awesome that she's putting that effort in. Um, Google Docs are great because you can easily um, comment, as you can see along the side here. I've commented a couple of times on here and the student is actually responding to me in the comments. So that's a really nice benefit of this kind of online back and forth is that we can really have a conversation about the work um, just right there on the screen and we have a record of what we've talked about. So if I wanna look back and see what has this particular student learned about writing, I can look at all those comments, I can look at multiple versions of the writing that they've done um, and I should be able to see the progress that that student is going through. Um, my students produce some really, really nice work 
So I won't talk too much about this one, but this is a student who chose to write basically a multi-paragraph essay for every single prompt each week. Um, it was just super awesome. Um, so she's working on organizing her paragraphs. Um, I have edited this using the suggestion feature on Google Docs. Um, so she can see my edits alongside her original writing. Um, there's a comment in the chat from Jane on a phone using Google Docs, they can dictate their responses and it will get typed for them. Yes, that is an awesome resource. I know many students will actually dictate it in their own language and then use, uh, they will like dictate it in English and see it spelled or they'll dictate it in their own language and then they'll have it written and then they'll translate it by looking at it side by side. So there's like a lot of things that um, students can use for writing. Thanks for pointing that out, Jane. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the benefits of demonstrations and models. Um, so first I just wanna ask if anyone has used Loom, if you wanna just give me a yes or no in the chat. Um, whether you've ever used Loom or not. Jane says yes, awesome Jane. Mostly looks like no. Okay, so I'll go over, um, since most of you are new to Loom, I will go over um, a quick demonstration of how to do it. Um, but first I just wanna tell you some of the reasons that I found this a helpful tool. So Loom is a screen recording app. It is a Google Chrome extension. So you have to install it on your, um, on your Chrome browser. And I'll show you how that looks in a second. Um, you can record your screen on any website. So it basically means that you're navigating to the website you wanna show your students. You're clicking the button and you're creating a recording of whatever you do next. Um, there are a few different ways to use it. So, and I've done all of these. Um, you can make a Google Doc with some examples, like I would be doing sentence examples to show a grammar concept. Um, you can teach a lesson. It's basically like using a whiteboard in your classroom. So if that's something you did a lot while you were teaching in person, um, this might be a nice way to transfer that. It's also great for recording instructions for navigating platforms, going to different sites, um, navigating what the assignments are and how to do them. So you could actually, if you're making a weekly checklist, you could do a Loom video of you just going through that checklist and showing them what's there, talking through it, clicking on the things, showing them what it looks like. Um, I think that probably anytime you're asking students to use a platform they're not familiar with, it's probably a good practice to do some sort of demonstration. And it's so easy in the classroom when you have students and you can see their screens and you can just go stand next to them and show them things. Um, this, this is kind of a substitute for that. It's, it's different, right? But it's at least that sort of demonstration so they can see you do it and then they can follow that. Um, Loom gives you the option to choose whether you just show your screen whether you show a camera of you talking or you can do both at the same time. Um, I found it's really easy to use. And um, it is, like I said, a Google Chrome extension. And then a huge benefit is that it just produces a link and you can share it with your students so they don't have to make an account or log in into everything. You have an account, but um, so you can keep track of your videos, but they just have that one step to get to the video. Um, Kim is asking, is it free? Yes. Are there time limits? I don't think so. Um, I've been making fairly short videos, like the longest I've made is 10 minutes. Um, but I think, I'm not sure if there's a time limit. I can try to find that out. I have not used Screencastify, but I've heard it's pretty similar to Loom. Um, so if that's a familiar tool for you, um, this would be an easy transfer. I'm not sure how those actually compare since I've only used this one. 
So I'm going to do um, a very quick demo for you. Um, Kim says Screencastify only has five minutes for free. Loom definitely has more than that. Um, I'm not sure what the upper limit is, but it is more than that. All right. So I'm going to show you how I would actually do this. Um, so I'm just going to do a little example with IXL, which is what I did pretty often during this time. Um, so I'm on my page that I want to show, which is just an IXL skill. And I'm logged into my own account. Um, and then this is the little extension up here for Loom. So now that I've already um, installed it, all I have to do is click on that extension and it will pop up to record what I have on this page. So it's just loading itself up. Um, so you, you can actually see your options and how to set it up. Um, I, I usually like to not do the video, um, but it's nice for students to see me, um, but also it's just a little weird to see myself in so many different places. Um, so I clicked the wrong button, sorry. Um, you can change the size of this Loom video. Um, you can make it bigger. You can also switch to a photo of yourself. So right now I'm on screen plus cam. I'm going to switch to screen only, and it's not recording my face anymore. Um, I'm going to make it small, and I can change my photo to a photo of myself instead of a photo of some trees. Um, I already have photos in there. Um, that's an easy step to add another profile photo. So I'm going to change to my little profile here. So students can see that it's coming from me, but they don't have to watch my face actually talking. Um, once I've done that, all I have to do is click start recording. And it gives you a little um, uh, select a screen option. And then it gives you a countdown. Um, you can pause if you're not ready. And then once you see this going on in the corner, it's actually recording. Um, so I'm recording myself, recording a Google Meet right now. It's very meta and strange. Um, once I'm, I can pause um, if I need to take a break or if I'm not sure what I'm going to say next. Um, and then I just resume. And when I'm done creating my recording, I just click the green check for finish recording. And you now can't see this, I guess. Um, sorry, I'll go back to presenting. But it's created um, a link, and it already copied the link for me. So I don't have to do anything else, but I can just stick my um, my link into my HyperDoc right away. Um, I'm also going to show you my Loom page where I have all my videos. So just give me one second and it should present again. All right, perfect. So this is my Loom account. Um, you just sign up for free. You can sign up with Google or with an email. Um, there's not a lot of steps in terms of the onboarding or setup for an instructor. And then I am already on the page for the video I just created. I can copy this link and I can share it with students in an email. Um, you can also make things private if you wanna add a password. I haven't done that. Um, I just leave it open. There's some nice easy editing tools. I have no experience editing videos or doing anything like that. And this is very easy. Um, there is a trim feature. So if you find that you're doing these videos, but you tend to feel awkward starting them, or you have like a long pause at the end, you can trim the edges of it really easily. Um, the students will see, basically they see this part 
of the screen, um, just the video. They can watch it sped up. And let me tell you, my middle school students love doing that because they're like, oh, Miss Pace, you sound like a chipmunk. That's hilarious. We're going to play it for you. You sound so stupid. So that's enjoyable. Um, they can leave you comments and they can react with an emoji. Um, Loom also gives you an update when people have viewed it. So it will show you how many people have viewed and it will send you an email if you want in terms of um, when a student views it. So I'm going to pause here and see if anybody has questions about Loom specifically. Um, feel free to put them in the chat or um, ask them out loud. I know that was a really quick um, <laughs> overview, but I will um, put some resources with how to's in the uh, in the presentation for you guys. Um, so Pat's asking what kind of feedback have I received from the students? Um, students tend to like it. It's e easy for them to get to, they said. Um, it's also very nice for them to have as a resource, they can pause it and go back. So um, some students have said that they were working on IXL, they didn't know how to do something, they went back and watched the video. So I think that's a pretty good um, testimonial because that's what it's for. Um, I don't know the upper time limit on how long. Um, yes, Marie, I have used it with my adult learners. So I've, I've sent them a Loom video pretty much every week. Um, mostly I've been using it for a grammar lesson slash demonstration. Um, Kim is asking, does Loom just let you know when it was opened or do they have to watch the whole video? I think it just lets me know when it's opened. Um, I'm not sure if there's like a, a, like they have to watch 30 seconds before it counts as a view or anything like that. Um, I will send you a sample lesson that I've used. So what I want to do is share my um, Google Slides presentation and I've linked all of my um, weekly checklists. And so you can actually click through them and look at what's the lesson, what skills did I pair it with, all of that kind of thing. Um, any other questions? So I will go back to my main point here. Um, and like I said, I can link some how-to videos. Loom has gone a long way to kind of inform people on how to use it through the site itself. Um, so it is kind of like Google in that once you enter it for the first time, there's like little pop-ups that show you how to do things, but they also have some videos on how to do everything. Okay, so I wanna talk about another aspect of modeling. Um, one of the things I try to do in my classes, whether they're face-to-face -face or online, is provide model assignments. So for example, this was my week two assignment. Um, they had to write three journal entries or, or diary entries um, throughout the week. And I provided three entries of my own. Um, they were from my actual journal that I personally keep, but I edited them a little bit so it wasn't sharing like my whole life story. Um, but what's really cool about this is that I have some students who use this model in a very intense way in that they really look at it to model their own writing off of it. So this is from one of my students and you can see how closely she has followed what I've done, right? So I start my first entry with things felt better today. Yesterday, I was annoyed. And she starts with today was a better day. Two weeks ago, I was so tired. Um, she really kind of 
looked at what I wrote, wrote her own version. And she did this with each entry. Um, the second entry that I wrote was about cooking. And I listed, we talk about food a lot in my class for some reason. Um, I listed all the things that I was making and talked about grocery shopping. And she also do um, did the same things, right? So something we all have more time to do now is cook. That's what I wrote. And she said, something we must do is spend our time in the kitchen. And she talked about grocery shopping and she talked about what she made for dinner. So this just kind of showed me um, how valuable it is to be sending demonstrations, models, examples, anything you can send to students that they can use as a resource for how to do the learning. And this was super easy for me to do. It didn't take a lot of time. And um, I just posted that as an example right on the HyperDoc so students could look at it if they wanted to. Um, finally, I just wanna talk a little bit about relationships and community. Um, for some teachers who are doing weekly online class meetings, this might seem like there's not that much community and that maybe the relationships that you've built with your students um, might suffer a little bit. I didn't really find that to be the case. Um, I found that we kept up our community really well. We still had a really great time interacting with each other. Um, so there were kind of two different ways that um, students could interact with me and with each other face to face. So first I had office hours, which I held two times a week in the evenings. Um, I had two different classes, one in Woonsocket and one in East Providence, and I just smushed them together. So it was really cool to see those students meeting each other and talking to each other. That was a super fun feature of this. Um, I did those office hours on Google Meet. People could show up for the whole time. Um, or they could show up for part or leave early. It was very flexible. Um, some students came religiously twice a week, every single time. Some students only came to office hours once or twice, but they were doing the reading assignments on their own and practicing IXL. So again, flexibility was the goal. Um, with those office hours, we mostly use that as community time. So I would kind of spend the first like 15 minutes or so just chatting, hearing from each student, asking them how they're doing. Um, if they were students who hadn't met before, having them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about themselves. And then I left it very open to what the students wanted to do. So I would say, what would you like to do tonight? We could do reading together. We could talk about writing. I could show you an example of how to do the writing. We could talk about grammar, what's helpful for you. And they got to drive the meeting basically and got to decide what they wanted for class. Um, a lot of times it was grammar. Um, sometimes we practice reading out loud. So I would pull up the text as a presentation and have each student take turns reading out loud to the group, which is always super fun to hear. Um, and they love that, I think. Um, my students said they liked that they got to choose what we were doing. Um, I had the last meeting I had, I said, what would you guys like to do? And there's this little pause. And then one of my students says, well, we could do grammar, but let's only spend 15 minutes on grammar and then let's do something else. And I was just like, OK, you just created our schedule. That's awesome. Let's go with it. So I really liked having that kind of responsiveness to what they wanted to learn. Um, the other aspect of our meetings was scheduling a one-on-one -on -one conference. So I have a little picture of the form I used. Um, super simple. All they had to do was fill out this form and then I would schedule a time with them. Um, I let my students choose whether they wanted a Google Meet or if they wanted to just do a phone call. And then I would just follow up with them and, and um, make it time. Uh, Maria is asking how long are my office hours? So I just did one hour per night. So I did a Tuesday seven to eight, Thursday seven to eight. Um, that seemed like a good amount. I think if I had more students, I might do longer. Um, and yes, it was different from a class 
meeting because it wasn't really instructional, but it was for the whole group. So everyone was invited to that, but it wasn't structured like, here's what I'm doing in class and I'm instructing the whole time. It was more of like a conversation time. Um, so office hours would be the full group and then the conference would be one-to-one. -one. Does that answer your question, Marie? Okay, thanks. Um, so I found a lot of benefit in having the one-to-one -one conferences. Not all the students wanted that, um, so they could just choose if they did that. Some did it every week. Um, some did it only once or twice. Um, usually I mostly use that conference to talk about writing. So if they had turned in the writing for that week, um, we could go through it together. I would give them written feedback also, but it was really helpful to have the writing in front of both of us and I can highlight things and correct things in front of them and show them. Um, I found that I had a lot more opportunity for individual feedback on writing through this model than I actually had in an in-person class because I could set aside time for just that student. Um, this example on the, um, on the right side is um, a conversation that blossomed out of a conference with a student. So she was super motivated to learn very nitty gritty things about grammar. And so this was on the bottom of her writing that she did. I just started typing out this whole lesson on grammar um, and it was just for that student. But now I've created this and I can use it in my class when this topic comes up again. So that was um, really cool because she would just ask me really specific questions and I could make sure that she understood and it was a very nice um, kind of one-to-one -one learning opportunity. Um, she kind of put me on the spot and made me explain all this grammar, but I think that's great. Um, and it, she really learned from it. Um, does anyone have more questions on how I did the face-to-face -face meeting, office hours, conferences, anything like that? Um, I would also be interested to know whether you in your class are doing full class meetings, small groups, individual, or a mix of both. So maybe you could put that in the chat of like, how have you managed this meeting concept with um, online learning? Okay, so a few people use a mix of both. Marie says group Zooms and one-on-one -on -one conferencing. Elizabeth's using a mix of both. Bill, you use a real whiteboard. Um, can you tell us more about that? Does that mean you have a whiteboard in your house and you're making a video of yourself? I'm just curious about that. Okay, so Bill says he has a whiteboard at home that he's actually using. Yeah, that's cool. I found that um, I really like using a blank Google Doc as a pseudo whiteboard and doing the Google Meet and just presenting that while I type. Um, I feel like that's the best equivalent that I found for that. I know that there are online whiteboard tools as well, um, but I haven't used any of those. Um, Marie also pointed out that there are breakout rooms in Zoom to do small groups, um, and I haven't used that yet, um, but I, I've heard that's a pretty helpful thing too if you want students to communicate with each other in smaller groups. Um, Jane says she's using multiple contact options, which I think is great. 
um, that definitely lowers the barriers. Um, and then Beatrice asks if anyone is using a document camera. I am not right now, but I think that's a great idea. Okay, so um, this is gonna answer Joan's questions uh, that she put about my favorite parts of online learning. Um, I just wanna get to this last slide and then if you've got more questions, I'll definitely answer them. Um, so here's what I've found to be the benefits of doing this particular model for online teaching. Um, I have more engagement hours from my students. So I had um, a class, each of my classes was two and a half hours once a week. And I've got some students who are doing less than that, but many students who are doing more than that. So they're looking at reading and writing and grammar multiple times through, week, uh, through the week, which I think is beneficial for their overall skill building and practice. So that's great. Um, I've had, I think the, the student who did the most did four to six hours per week as a combination of office hours, conference, IXL, reading and writing. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, for the once a week class. Um, I found that I was able to give really rich individual feedback and, and also have more of a back and forth conversation about it because I just had more time um, to conference with individuals and write to individuals back and forth. Um, this model allows for student agency and empowerment, so they can really choose how much or how little they are doing every week, and they can choose what parts of the assignments they want to do and in what order and when. So it just kind of opens that up um, and makes them a little bit more responsible for their own learning, but also allows them to feel like they have ownership of it. Um, I really loved my community time office hours because they were very responsive and very fun and just like super warm and comforting and, and lovely. Like I just have really lovely people as my students. Um, so it was like a great time to just talk to each other. I found like students connected with each other. They asked each other questions. Um, they talked about the reading, um, which was awesome. Um, Maria is pointing out in the chat that her students also connect via WhatsApp, um, which is a really cool option for them to talk to each other. I like that. Um, Elizabeth says she's using a document camera and it works wonderfully some, some days, not so well other days. So it might be a good option. Um, if you wanted to do this model, um, you could do it with any subject, I think. So it works pretty well for reading and writing and grammar, um, but anything where you feel like your students need lots of skill practice and you don't need that much direct instruction, this would be a good um, model to use for you because it's really independent assignments that are building student skills. They're getting lots of support and feedback, but it is a little bit more independent. Um, I found it, it was easy to produce the weekly assignments and it was a low amount of planning time for me so I could spend more time actually interacting with students and giving them lots of support and feedback. Um, I've got some positive, positive comments from students. Um, students have said things like they enjoy seeing each other every week. It's a, a happy time for them. Um, they said that the conferences helped a lot with their writing. Um, they have also said that when we read together, they understand it better. So um, that office hour time of reading out loud and kind of talking through the reading um, was really helpful for them. And that's something they liked in face-to-face -face class as well. So we only have a couple of minutes, but I can stick around uh, longer. And if anyone's got questions, feel free to shout them out, put them in chat.
Thank you, Kim. Great to see you. <laughs> see you. Um, so, Joan, can I send my uh, Google Slides presentation so everyone can access it? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes. So what will happen is, um, yes, you should send it to me and then it will go into the... Sorry, you probably couldn't hear me. <laughs> okay, so yes, you should send it to me. And then what we will do is um, by Friday, we will certainly, which is really tomorrow, isn't it? We will put it into uh, the weekly announcements and um, resources that we do every Friday. And then eventually we're working on this. They will be posted on the Rhode Island Adult Ed website as well. Um, but they'll definitely be the announcements tomorrow. So. Um, if you send it to me today, we should definitely be able to get that out tomorrow. Great. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll put a couple of additional resources at the end of that presentation, um, okay. so how to use Loom and um, things like that. Sounds awesome. It, thank you. I love the way that this has been organized today. I know one of the things we keep hearing from uh, different people is, uh, you know, people kind of had to leap into this and being organized around it can be pretty challenging and it looks like you have figured out how to be organized around it and I think yeah. that's a big part of it personally so any other feedback before we uh, close off for the day thank you all for joining us it was um, it was nice to see so many questions throughout as well um, we don't always see that and that was I think particularly helpful Okay. Bye. Thanks, Nora. <laughs> Bye, Kim. <laughs> my there's a little Kim there. <laughs> yep. She's a teacher in training. Awesome. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Nora. I am going to uh, stop recording us so that we don't we don't need to be recorded any longer. So, but th this has been great. Thank you. Thank you.